I think there's a section in um, first year or second year where you go to the zoo and you study an animal and then you try to inhabit that animal for about three or four hours solid. Oh, um, no. Bananas. Bananas. <laughs> oh, like... Which was your food. animal? I chose a wolf. And that's... It's a tricky one because you have to be on all fours and, like, you obviously can't be... You can't have your knees actually touching the ground. So you're like... Bear crawl. Yeah. You're like bear crawling, but you have to keep your spine and, and oh, bum no. real flat. So no. you can't like it. It was a fucking <laughs> night, four hours long. I was absolutely gassed. And then you go off to train in the evening. So I think there was a period in first year where I was absolutely ripped, fit and just part wolf. permanently tired. <laughs> yeah, part wolf. <laughs> For more where that came from and to hear the complete extended cut of this interview and all our interviews with no ads every single week to get access to the full back catalogue of everything we've ever produced here at Irishman Abroad for the price of just a pint every month, go to patreon.com forward slash Irishman Abroad. That's the small talk. Now let's get down to business. Now, your programme. What's the big idea? Well, they've grown to know the Irish much better. We've now got to know how largely their mind works. I moved over here and immediately I had to up my game. I could not have done the job I, I did for quite a number of years in Ireland. I had to go and earn my living in England. I think a lot of it's in my hair. I think there's a lot of Ireland in here. I had an Irish upbringing. 20 years after an Irishman couldn't get a fucking job, we had the presidency. It was some heightened awareness of how hard my tribe had had it in London. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Never has a nation so small inspired so much in another. So you could say there's always been a little green behind the red, white and blue. Our family is very Irish, you know. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special announcement to make at this stage. Would you welcome, please, the wonderful Charlie Thrigo! You're very welcome to this episode 352 of An Irishman Abroad with me, John Regan, and our guest today is Irish actor Paul Meskell, who you may not have heard of, or maybe you did. Paul is a bit of a, a one-off, uh, trained at the Lear Academy in Ireland's National Academy of Dramatic Art, and immediately after graduating, he was cast in the title role of Great Gatsby at Dublin's Gate Theatre. I mean, it doesn't get bigger than that, really. This was the first, though, of several consecutive leading stage roles in both Dublin and London. And his credits include The Red Shoes, Asking For It, The Plough and the Stars, A Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. He's just finished shooting Lisa McGee's new drama, The Deceived. Lisa McGee, who you'll know is creator of Dairy Girls and a friend of the show. He shot a short film, Drifting, and also in January 2020, Paul played the title role in Martin McDonough's critically acclaimed Lieutenant of Inish Moore and got absolutely rave reviews. But the reason he's on the show today is because, of course, of normal people, the highly anticipated 12-part relationship drama that he stars in and his first television role as Connell. He stars opposite British actress Daisy Edgar-Jones, who you'll know from War of the Worlds and Cold Feet, and she stars in the role of Marianne. And the series follows two young people navigating adulthood in contemporary Ireland and their complicated relationship from the end of their school days in Sligo to their undergraduate years in Dublin. It also stars Sarah Green, another friend of the show, Ashley McGuckian. Sally Rooney adapted her coming-of-age book, the, the book Normal People, you, I'm sure you already know of, that won so many awards and critical acclaim across the world. But she adapted it with Alice Birch along with Irish playwright Mark O'Rourke. And Normal People has been directed by another friend of the show, Lenny Abramson, and the English director Hetty MacDonald. And I had the chance to watch four episodes of it. Like they send you the four episodes in the little preview. And uh, I had, uh, like, I just had one of those moments where you're watching something, you're going, this is classic this is going to be big I really urge you to seek it out it's on BBC by the time you hear this it'll be out there now it's a BBC 3 production in association with uh, Hulu and Screen Ireland the series executive producer is Ed Guiney who you'll know from Element Pictures who produced The Favourite Room Dublin Murders many many more Ed is actually going to be on the podcast next week which is something I'm really excited about I've wanted to have him on for a long long time but he'll be on today is about Paul though 
and about normal people and really having a bit of a deep dive into this. His career, his early days as a minor footballer for Kildare, my home county. And we really get into it. There's an awful lot to talk about in terms of young people, toxic masculinity, his start in life and how it all could have been very, very different. But it is a big crossover in this series, this book, this subject, Paul's life itself and our chosen charity partner, Jigsaw.ie. What Jigsaw.ie does is it focuses on young people, their mental health and tries to equip them with the skills and support that they will need to survive in life. And as you know, just from living nowadays, it is a massive challenge today to your mental health. What are young people going through? What are young people uh, preparing for their leaving cert going through, not knowing where the future lies? It's incredibly unsettling time. And as a result, Jigsaw.ie has seen the demand for their services increase by 400%. So if ever there was a time that they need your support, it's now. Pop over to Jigsaw.ie forward slash now. Kick in a tenor if you can. And if you want to hear the rest of this conversation, to hear the full thing in its full form, head over to patreon.com forward slash Irishmanabroad and become a premium member today. Paul Meskell, it's great to have you on Irishman Abroad, especially kind of the night before. That's when this will go out. <laughs> the night before yeah. <laughs> this incredible project hits screens and... I know people will be listening back to this with the benefit of having seen it, I guess, by that time. You must feel, and I've heard you talk about, the pressure and strain, the expectation of the readers, the images that people form of books that haven't been adapted are really precarious and delicate, and often people are very protective of them. How close did what you made match up to the image that you had in your mind when you read the book yeah well first of all i just want to say thank you so much for having me on it uh, it feels lovely and full circle because I, I listened to the show loads so thank ah, you but um, you're very welcome it's kind of something that i've been talking about a lot and kind of the, the 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 press campaign which has all been kind of via zoom and skype which is has been mad but um a lot of the questions are coming from people who are fans of the book and mm. and with that and I include myself in that category. I absolutely adore the book. So I think there's a natural pressure that comes with adapting a book that has been so loved, like not only like in Ireland, but kind of globally. And I think I'm probably too close to the project to be um, objective, but I do feel like throughout the process of filming it that there was a real effort to maintain the spirit of the book. And, I, I, and I've seen the 12 episodes back and I definitely feel like we have, we haven't done a series based on the book. We have adapted the book for screen. And I do feel like that comes across in it, thankfully. I mean, your uh, life changes dramatically, basically through one visit to a guidance counsellor. I mean, they, all, none of this happens for you without that visit. Am I right in saying that? Yes, it, like, I suppose that was kind of the, the the real gear shift moment. But if I, went, if I went back before that, it was kind of, I did a school musical when I was 16 and kind of fell in love with the idea of, or I fell in love with the immediate kind of adrenaline rush that I got whenever I was on stage because it's just, a, it's a terrifying experience. And with that comes a huge amount of adrenaline. But I didn't have any other kind of markers in my life or I didn't know any other actors who were getting paid to be an actor or that, that that was their job. So you kind of progress through the final two years of school and you're thinking, oh, what can I kind of do that um, allows me to stay playing Gaelic football? Because that was a huge part of my life as well. So how, how do I facilitate both those things? So I was looking at like law and arts and minutes, so, something that like I could stay at home go to college and, and train in the evenings but ultimately the closer I got to the kind of dreaded CAO form and the kind of prospect of doing that I realized that that I think and I kind of know now would have made me incredibly unhappy not the football side of it but the 
just doing something for the sake of it academically, I think, um, would have, like, like, I met a, a guidance counsellor at the tail end of sixth year. She was actually one of my mum's friends because I was having a bit of a panic attack about what, what I was going to do. And she Literally or figuratively, you were having a panic attack? Oh, uh, figuratively, borderline. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, she came into the house and she just asked me a series of very basic questions. She was like, what do you enjoy doing in school? And the more we kind of delved into it, it was kind of the like texts in English and like Shakespeare's and, uh, and the like prescribed texts. And then she's like, what do you like doing in your life? And I was like, football, because that was at the front of my brain. And she was like, mm. also, you, you clearly like being on stage. And I, I think it took somebody else to articulate that for me to then go, oh, yeah, that's the first thing that I could really see myself being happy studying at, at, at third level. So then there was kind of a frantic um, kind of applying for drama schools, all of which had kind of closed their applications because it was quite late on in, in, in the year or in, in that kind of process. And I remember emailing Anne Fitzpatrick, who was the kind of head of administration at the Lear. It's kind of like, uh, I'm really sorry, I know I'm, I'm a couple of days late, but would you be happy to <laughs> accept a submission for me to audition? Like, and they said yes. And I kind of had a week or two weeks to kind of pick two monologues and that kind of kicked off that process. I mean, Paul, it's mad. Like it is, it is kind of mad yeah, that yeah. <laughs> you, you missed it. You, like you missed your window, and yeah. only for the charitable uh, nature of Anne, you get your shot. It's, I guess, is there's something in that for people who, you know, conform to deadlines and go, oh, I've missed it, to know that it is possible to speak to totally. somebody's kindness and for your life to change. But there's a few things in there. Uh, first of all, uh, the power of uh, these guidance counselors like oh man like it's uh, be, because they're they're you're normally in contact with them at a very formative period of your mm. life where you're quite impressionable and mm. i was lucky that in that situation in, in that situation that i didn't get that opportunity through school now there was got there was guidance counselors in school but they're literally having to d process students in like five ten minute slots and often yes. those, like <laughs> And, and it's it's totally unfair to them, but I, I think I was lucky that my mum knew somebody and we were able to come in and chat for, it, it, it took an evening, like it takes an hour or two, three hours to process a massive decision that you have to make at mm. the age of 18 where you're not still fully sure of who you are, but yet you have to make a decision definitively what you kind of see yourself as as a 22, 23, 24 year old when you finish studying. And uh I found that kind of five to six months of my life incredibly stressful because you're you're kind of forming your identity on a loose idea of who you are. I can't imagine what it's like for students right now in this uh, oh God, pandemic. Love. Yeah. And, and also just like, you know, my own experience of it was horrendous as well. And I completely made a decision that was based on. Sure, that'll that's roughly <laughs> in the area of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of should you like and yeah. and and also a load of peripheral extracurricular stuff that that shouldn't have been a factor was a factor. And I guess the it's kind of a good jumping off point for our conversation, because this window of time that the book focuses on and the series focuses on and the type of person that Connell is as a, a young Irish lad with an inability to articulate what he's thinking and feeling is something that I'm absolutely fascinated with. And a lot of what I write is about that and about yeah. coming out of that. And, you know, for both of us moving abroad into that kind of open landscape of expression and the understanding that it's OK to yeah. say what you think, whereas your background was uh, and all of our backgrounds as I Irish lads was the less you said, the better. <laughs> the, men so true, yeah. <laughs> the mention you, you gave there to the first. I don't want to leave this behind this uh, first experience on stage. The Phantom of the Opera, as I understand it, was <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're laughing, I guess, because uh, it it is your first experience of, I guess, like I always believe that stage is 
love at first sight. And that when people ask me, should I be a stand up comedian? I say, get up, go and do it, because if the light comes on inside you, you know, it's the thing for you, because if it doesn't, it's not going to start coming on. No, yet. no, you'll know very, very quickly if it's for you or if it's not, I think. Yeah. And yes, you, 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 you suffered with actual knee knocking stage fright oh. uh, in this. Talk to us about that. So, like, I, I suppose I have to give a like massive shout out to my secondary school in the sense that, like, in transition year, they have a policy in which you can't not audition for it. Like, because I know for a fact, even if I remember watching the school musicals and they're kind of a big event in the school calendar, they they bring in tiered seating and the school hall becomes like a theater of 600, 700 people. Oh, wow. And they big production values, build, build the stage, bring in professional lighting and sound designers. And um, so I remember you'd go to it and w- watching a school musical it's like it's a real partisan crowd it's like moms and dads and everybody's roaring after you finish a song and and i remember sitting in they did hairspray the year before phantom and i remember sitting in the audience being like holy shit this i can't imagine the buzz that they're all feeling backstage Mm, mm. and thankfully like that policy is in place where you have to audition and i remember talking to my dad after hairspray and i was like oh next year i think i'd I'd really like to give that a whack because it looks like great crack. So the auditions came around and I, 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 what, I think I, I sang, um, uh, that, uh, what's the song? The higher you build your the barriers, the taller I become. That was the song I, I sang for the audition. And I had this affliction whenever I'd get nervous, I'd be like, right, stand really straight. And I'd like lock out my knees. And then because the shake. Seemed, seemed to be coming from my knees when I locked out my knees the whole body started to <laughs> vibrate and so you, you'd get over the kind of that would stop when I'd sing in front of three or four people after time and I kind of thought that I'd gotten over that affliction unfortunately I was uh I got a rude awakening because what when when you go and, and you try and sing in front of 600 700 people that uh that came back with a vengeance but um yeah, I, I auditioned for it and I ended up kind of I was blissfully ignorant in terms of like, it, it, I was just enthusiastic and wanted to get it. And I ended up getting the Phantom and putting like figuring out how to sing very quickly. And um, I remember being petrified, but having this feeling when I walked on stage that I not that I knew that I what I was doing, but that. I loved what I was doing and that mm. I, I, I went when I was on stage, I wasn't thinking about anything else. I wasn't thinking about sport. I wasn't thinking about friends or family. I was thinking about the situation and, and, and the characters on stage. And I found that, I don't know, I found that really private and kind of like, it's a very sexy thing at 16 to be able to express the things that these characters are feeling because like, to, to bring it back to the novel slightly like as a 16 year old expressing things that you're feeling isn't like the kind of go to thing so no. getting to do that on stage I found like incredibly intoxicating and then like coming out and bowing at the end and like hearing like a roar of like the people in your community sh- like screaming and roaring as if they're at like a Rolling Stones concert was like <laughs> I remember coming home and just being like, oh, I, I adored that. Petrified every single night. But I don't know, like that kind of immediate adrenaline rush was like the only thing that I could equate it to is like winning a big match. But those <laughs> winning big matches is few and far between. You, I kind of got that rush like a hit night after night after night. And I, I think I've been kind of chasing that feeling because I've never felt that level of adrenaline since i don't think wow i mean i have a bunch of questions there Mm. because i completely know what you're talking about and that is the light right that is the light coming on and the addictive nature of it i mean like that hit is and that chase that you're on to to recapture that Mm -hmm. it is similar to the sporting thing that like you're trying to get back to that place yeah. of a buzz of achievement of sense of 
we did it. It was all worth it. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it was worth the pain and the knee knocking and the training and yeah, totally. Yeah, it's it, it, it's the reward versus the the effort that you put into it. I find that's the most satisfying thing about it. Do you wonder if because I've certainly asked myself this question because uh, I similarly was invested in sport in an absurd way, like <laughs> in, in, in a way that like I look back on my diaries at the time, how like kind of deluded uh, I, <laughs> I was <laughs> and how I, you nearly need to be deluded to do the amount of training and commitment that is involved in playing for a team at a high level, even at underage. I wonder, though, sometimes if knowing what I know now about my life and knowing what you know about your life and the course that you've taken and how well that's worked out. Was I into sport or was I into performance? Was it actually the thing that I loved and the thing that I still love is backstage, side of stage before we go out? I always loved getting ready to run out for games. Yeah, that, that was the bit that I loved. Oh, I <laughs> love the running out because, I, I, to be honest, I felt I always find that like the day of a match hor- like horrendous because you're, the t- time seems to slow down. But I totally mm. agree that that moment just before you leave the dressing rooms, when you line up and your, your captain runs you out, that's the that's the kind of the release of energy. Like you're you start to leave like little bits of yourself in the dressing room or like I, I hate it. a similar thing is like I hate the day of opening night I like I hate the day but once you get to the half hour call suddenly you feel you're getting to performance and I think I, 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 I don't associate like performance necessarily just with acting I think performance is about preparing your body and your mind through training through rehearsals Mm. and then when you do all that and you prepare effectively and you prepare and you sacrifice certain things in your life it leaves you generally i believe in 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 the best in the best position to deliver and to perform and i think when you feel the sacrifice and you feel the hard work that you put in translate onto the stage or onto a pitch i just think Irregard, like regardless of the result, preferably you want to win and you want to do well. But when you feel those things align, it's an incredibly satisfying experience. It's flow, right? That's yeah. what we're getting to is everything you say there is about having known you've done your homework to the level of then blowing the whistle or the curtain going up. It's the most relaxing thing is knowing if I'm doing this right, I'm not thinking I'm oh, totally. I'm, I'm flowing within it. Uh, when yeah. was the first time you, you you felt that outside of the Phantom? I personally what I like the uh, regiment and kind of structure. So because I, I knew in terms of like in a footballing compa- capacity, I was a defender and I wasn't the most skill- skillful of footballers. So I knew that for me to succeed it would require me to be maybe fitter than other people or to kind of develop a kind of mental toughness that I I was just kind of dogged because I wasn't going to be able to kick points from 65 yards or Mm. or dummy solo it was it it, it was kind of a mental thing so I I think I developed that kind of to, to use the word flow from kind of I was quite strict with myself and I enjoy kind of not punishment, but I, I enjoy when you feel like you're working re- really hard because it eliminates doubt when you get to that point of performance, be that on stage or, or on the field. And I think for me, that's the only time I can ever achieve that kind of that's the only time I can really feel free in anything is when I feel like I have prepared effectively. And I, mm. I, I don't I don't think flow is something that just kind of um happens by chance I suppose is what I'm saying and yeah, I think yeah, yeah. That, that is kind of I think the fact that I wasn't the most skillful footballer has, has informed the way that I prepare in terms of acting so yeah tell me this though the uh, your Wikipedia says that the the football came to an end through a jaw in- injury is that correct it, it, it is correct kind of in a certain in a certain sense so um 
I got into the Lear and they have a policy which is totally right and fair that uh, they kind of prohibit contact sport. But I um, I was playing for the Kildare under 21s at that point and I, I was 18. So I, I was like, right, look, I'll throw myself wholeheartedly into this training. But I wasn't ready to kind of just drop football. It was too big a part of my life. There was too many kind of formative yeah you put too much in at that yeah, point I put yeah. too much in and I was I, I was absolutely in love with the sport and in love with my teammates and, and still am and I couldn't reconcile that because I wasn't even I, I literally I wasn't even sure if I was going to be good enough to be an actor so why sacrifice something that I knew that I, I was good at and that, that that worked for me so and was going the right direction let's face it that that minor team that you were in that group yeah. were, were a talented bunch right yeah and they're all playing with the with the senior team now and, and they're they're absolute gentlemen and I just I just really enjoyed that and, and would go back in a heartbeat if if I thought the two worlds kind of collided in some sense but so I went I played under 21 football with Claire and, and, and senior with the club through first and second year of college and I was like okay right I do going into third year I was like I am going to um stop playing for my final year because it was all the nature of third year in drama school is you just do productions you go from production to production to production and I was like right I've given football a huge period of my life let's let's really crack into this and I we were playing Moorfield in a championship quarter final on the Saturday and I was starting third year on the Monday and uh it was a breaking ball I went to reach for it and I got there and I was uh marking somebody who uh shall remain la- nameless but was a uh, a kind of old county veteran and, and uh, an excellent footballer. But Please say eight. his name. Please. No, I, Mor- I, I, Moorfield I, I, is I actually, my team. You know I, that. I actually, I, I can't because uh, he is held in high regard amongst the county. And I think um, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> basically, I, I'm going to say this. I think his legs were a little bit shot and I was a young lad. Like he had roasted me all day, but I was starting to like my legs were, um, I, I was in good nick. And then I went out to catch a breaking ball and like I was properly reaching for the ball, so it was nowhere near my face, and I just got a forearm across the jaw, oh. broke my jaw, and then the the physio ran on and was like, had a look at me, and he was like, okay, yeah, can you open your mouth? And I opened my mouth, and I he was like, oh, yeah, great, great. And I was like, am I good to go? Am I good to go? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're grand. So I stuck the gum shield back in, and when I bit on the gum shield, I just felt this <laughs> searing pain up the oh. side of my face. But at which point the physio said no I, I think you're all right it's just it's it's a it, it, it could be a bit tight from the impact so I played on till the end of the match and only realized like the the jaw broke when I got the slap I only realized after if I'd got another knock in it my jaw would have like properly shattered and I would have had to get it wired shut but I was lucky that it was a clean break and um that I didn't have to like so I just had to kind of rehearse with my mouth kind of shut and I rehearsed for the play sorry we started the play on Monday and I also had to tell everybody in college that uh, I was working in Maxall at the time and that I got mugged behind the till and got punched (laughs) in the face because I couldn't tell them I was playing football (laughs) my deep dark secret was that I was playing (laughs) oh my god oh lord so you performed did you perform the show Kanye style through the wire (laughs) Uh, I was I was actually so lucky that I didn't have to be wired or anything like that I just had to kind of keep I had to like just do it like you were a puppeteer oh but like it you're... healed really quickly it like healed within three weeks but it was two weeks of rehearsal i just had to like talk with my teeth touching each other so hello everybody say, hello everybody <laughs> how are we <laughs> uh, you know there's an awful lot in that paul in that it, it really does relate to connell in so mm-hmm. many ways that the double life aspect of it in that I know that I know what you're talking about when you say those lads were gents and still are gentlemen, that probably sport gets a bit of a rough ride in the sense that I'd imagine that those lads are very accepting and understanding of your choice in uh, studying drama yeah. and that it wasn't as the stereotype would would confirm the oh, are, are you gay going yeah, doing totally. that? That it, instead there was probably a fascination with it in, in some ways. That said, yeah. they are two different worlds. Yes. And, you know, you were changing gears from 
one thing to another. I've heard you describe in another interview that that drama at the Lear is nearly cult like in that Mm. you're (laughs) in these black clothes doing this very weird thing, establishing this bond with a group of people who are essentially the only people that can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. (laughs) And then going on and literally donning another costume and having to, as you say, have this mental toughness, which is nearly the, you know, the opposite end of that spectrum. Am I right in saying this? That like you're shutting off those the tenderness and the emotional good stuff that's required to be great on your college course in the evenings to go and train. Yeah. I've actually not thought of it, but I think what I, I, I totally and that's what I was trying to get at, I think, earlier when I said like the training was cult like and and that I think oddly suits my personality. It requires total investment. And I think, yeah, I, 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 I never thought of it. I think, and I think that's a great point to kind of go from a kind of intellectual kind of and an emotionally kind of interrogate uh, when you're interrogating all those things in college and then running around the place trying to tear people's heads off on a pitch. It's, uh, but I think ultimately the commonality in it is it's about challenging yourself both mentally and physically. And I think sport is as mentally challenging as it is physically. And I think acting is certainly incredibly mentally challenging. And I think it's not that I struggled with, with actually jumping between the two, because I, I think I see more similarities in both sport and acting than I do differences. I think it's all about mental toughness and preparation. And I think, and that's totally been colored by my experience with Gaelic football. So I think ultimately it's a positive thing. And, and I think I also encountered football at a time when those cultures of kind of hyper masculinity were, were changing and that Mm. I was able to turn around to the lads and say, uh, yeah, lads, I'm 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 gonna be going to drama school next year, and for that to be a laugh for a second, but then to be like, for them to do their homework then and go like, oh, geez, that's really good. You got in there. It's, I heard it's really tough to to like all of the all of those things, and mm. and I think maybe ten years before that, that wouldn't be, wouldn't have been the case. And I think I think you're totally right that a lot of kind of, I I find it very difficult to relate to people when they when they talk about toxic masculinity within sport because that's genuinely not my experience of it and that's not remotely me saying that it doesn't exist within sport because I'm absolutely positive that it does but I'm always curious about it because that's I I was lucky that I played sport to quite a high level and it was never something that I experienced firsthand in fact kind of it's, it's interesting during this quarantine period like even on Sunday I got a phone call from my football manager Brian Murphy who was my manager four or five years ago and a lad that was, I was playing for Kildare with Chris like I haven't spoken to him in three years and I, I think they caught wind that I was over in London and by myself and things like that and like I think that's an that's an incredible thing mm. testament to the bonds and the relationships that you cultivate when you're kind of in the trenches with other, other people playing sport Connell's a, a kind of a bit removed from that. And it's great to hear you say that, that that's mm. your experience of sport and uh, your understanding of it and how much it's changing or mm. changed in, in quite a short period of time. Really, Connell, I get the impression, is in much more toxic situation. I mean, there's the scene where one of the lads shows him a picture message of uh, his girlfriend and we don't get to see the picture message, but you know, Connell is in the process of changing as he is through the whole series. And he he makes a half hearted attempt to call this out mm-hmm. in that. He says, do you think that's OK, showing pictures of your girlfriend to me like that? And this character, who I have to say is brilliantly played. I don't know the name of the actor offhand, but he, it's uh, Aina. he's he's phenomenal. He's Aina Hardwick's his name. He's one. Of, he was actually the year below me in drama school. And he's like, one of my best mates and he's just like he oh, knocks it out the yeah. park. Oh, right? he smashes it. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Even just his resting facial expression, I felt <laughs> was superb <laughs> yeah. because there's a kind of 
I'm not sure whether I should be laughing at this. <laughs> he yeah. can't he can't decipher between what's a joke, what's good crack and what is just out of line and completely wrong. Connell gets derided in that moment for getting awful gay about these things of yeah. late. And I guess it hints at other things that we haven't seen that may have taken place. My question is, when you're going in and taking yourself into that character and empathizing with him, are you drawing on those lads that you remember from around that time? Or are you actively seeking out individuals that you see around the place that kind of would be more like Connell than you? I, yeah, I, I distinctly remember, and, and th- I don't, act, I definitely didn't pull on this when I was, when I was preparing, but it's actually only from you to uh, kind of telling that story that I, I remember in, I was in first year in school and I, the idea of it, I find so terrifying now. So it's 10 years ago, I'm 24, I was, would, would have been 14. I remember there was a, a, a nude photograph had been sent around. And I remember sitting down the back of the class and I remember kind of made me kind of question my own sexuality because I find, found the whole idea of nudity being kind of shown on phones terrifying. But it, was, it had nothing to do with my sexuality. It, it had to do with the fact that I just felt incredibly bad for this person's privacy to be invaded in such a toxic way but there there was a degree of performance in it that you kind of had to feel like oh that's that's mad jesus like you and i remember turning to one of my friends at the time and i was like i think this is really bad form and he turned to me and he was like yeah no no no, it is but like just just act, like pretend that it, pretend that you're you're cool with it he said we were, those words yeah but, but we were both in the same boat because i i confided in him because i like you can just mm. tell when somebody's like a bit shook by it and I, I was like, and he was like, yeah, just, just act up because like you're, you're in, you're in first year and you're trying to mm. make new mates. But I, I remember, I remember I went home and I just told my mom and I started crying because like she was a guard and I, I knew that it had been sent to the guards and that there was some sort of policy going on. And I just remember being like, oh, I'd hate that to be my sister or my brother who was victimized in that way. And I think that was the and it's not remotely that I I'm proud in the fact that I didn't partake in it, but I definitely didn't stand up against it. Mm. And I think what Connell does in that scene, fair enough, he's not 14, he's 18 years old. And I think with that comes a certain degree of conviction. And I think what he does there is actually an incredibly, I, I consider that to be an incredibly brave thing because he's separating himself from the, the social values that his friends have. He's literally, he's, he's standing up and making a comment but going, do you think that's okay? And that's, that's a hard enough thing to do now at 24, let alone at, at 18. And for somebody who's kind of suffers with his place in the world and, and what his social identity is. Um, and I, yeah, yeah, I just, it's funny, that story literally just popped back into mm. my head. So that story, right, it, mm-hmm. it, it does tie in with how you were essentially told by your friend there, just stick to the script. Stick to the script. That's that's Connell, right? That, yeah. That's Connell. Is so, there's so much adherence to the role that he perceives himself to have and other people have for him that he's unwilling to uh, own his truth. Yeah. In terms of his emotions, in terms of who he's in love with. Time and time again, we see it in these first four episodes. I've obviously only seen the first four episodes because of, uh, you know, what the PR yeah. people have given me. But, you know, it really made me not like him in those. Oh, yeah. Like, I really just was like, oh, it, it, you're, it, you have no courage maybe whatsoever. Maybe a question I have for you in the sense that like I totally understand why you didn't like him at certain points of, of the show but I think that's maybe to do that we, potentially that we see him in, as a kind of archetypal jock who's smart who's popular 
and uh, with that there's a kind of social responsibility because with that is a there's a certain degree of social power and he doesn't utilize it to his best but i ultimately think that sally's playing with the idea of what a jock looks like and mm. he doesn't really fulfill the, the kind of classic image of it because he's he is fundamentally quite sensitive and i wonder if maybe and i could be wrong here is that you're annoyed with them because maybe we all recognize parts of ourselves inside mm. and that that's the frustrating parts of ourselves maybe yeah i think that uh definitely uh, i think it's okay to not like him like I, I i don't i think that probably that's the beauty of this and the beauty of sally's writing is that the no one's black and white there's things that I don't like about myself and that I've done that I regret. And, you know, the fact that he stands by while she's being abused by others in in the school is a really dark moment that really dark. Yeah, um, I found that scene one of the hardest to shoot because. You <laughs> at that point, you I had a very clear idea of who he was and also where he gets to in the book and how much events like that are going to really play on his conscience and rightfully so. But I think ultimately, it, I I just think it would make it way too Disney, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't I wouldn't believe it if no. he stood up in front of those guys and said, "Lads, you're 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 out of order," because I I I I've never I seen that take place. Place. I've never seen that take place. I've seen it take place in kind of American dramas and 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 like, Karate Kid. <laughs> Karate Kid, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't. But that doesn't make his behavior okay. What it does do is make it recognizable, and I think. That's what I think is so attractive about doing a job like this. It's because it's Sally isn't Sally isn't commenting on what's right and wrong. She's just showing what is I feel like an authentic representation of what school and human beings are like. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately as a result of how detailed she is in that kind of process ultimately you do have a huge amount of empathy for the characters because suddenly you start you start placing yourself in those characters and that that hasn't happened for me when i've read a book or played a part before to the same extent so while i have you there to say that there is more from paul meskel over on our patreon premium feed as you know we are now an independent podcast member-led crowdfunded whatever way you want to look at it it's down to you uh, if you want the show to continue we need your support simple as that it can't continue without you so go over to patreon.com forward slash irish man abroad and in return you get the full catalog you get the full portfolio of our podcast every single episode we've produced all the way back to 2013 Right now, there's only a hundred of our previous episodes available on iTunes, but you can get access to everything we've ever produced, including our bonus series, Irishman Behind Bars, Men Behaving Better. And of course, every single week, there's bonus content, including in this episode where uh, Paul gets into his own personal life, really his own romantic life and how it feels now to have that uh, looked into. And an item of significance and importance to the world, having done the work that he's done. We also talk a little bit more about his recommendations for lockdown. I guess it's something that you have to nearly ask guests. Barry Keoghan made some amazing recommendations last week for Irish films that you should see while in lockdown. And uh, you might be surprised at the couple of recommendations that Paul makes. I throw in a couple of my own as well while we're at it. And um, he talks about, uh, look, we get go, head over to patreon.com forward slash Irishman abroad and enjoy an extra half an hour conversation with Paul uh, by becoming a patron for the price of a pint every month. I don't ask for anything. Other than that, if you want to enjoy this podcast for free, that's very much up for you to decide. The one thing we do here is we try and elevate and support one chosen charity partner. And that chosen charity partner is Jigsaw.ie. Go to Jigsaw.ie forward slash now because now more than ever, they need your support. Please donate 10 euros if you can. Jigsaw is a mental health charity who deliver vital mental health services and supports across our communities back home in Ireland. Every day, Jigsaw work with young people, their parents, their grandparents, the teachers, their communities and clubs and more to help them be equipped and ready 
or deal with the crisis that they're dealing with. And right now we are in a mental health crisis for these young people back in Ireland. We all know how hard it was to be a young person back home. And they're trying to change that. There's been a 400% increase in demand for their online services and support. Isolation is leaving millions of us without the core things we value for our mental well-being, whether it's a hug from a grandchild, a conversation, just a walk in a park or a friend. Well, Jigsaw is there to fill that gap. And by donating 10 euros, you can really help them to be there for more young people back home in Ireland. So the place to go to do that is jigsaw.ie forward slash now. And... Uh, you know, you can walk around with your head held high knowing that you've done something positive this week to help somebody else. It feels great when you do it. Only takes five minutes. Anyway, enough of my yapping. Come back at the end. I've got more news on upcoming episodes across our series and across our different feeds. But for now, sit back and enjoy more of Paul Meskel. My name's Porter Carrington. My name is Chris O'Dowd. My name is Philomena Lee. My name is Brian O'Driscoll. My name is Tommy Tiernan. My name's Eamon Dunphy. My name's Ashley B. My name is David Walsh. I'm Ronan O'Gara. My name is Cecilia Hearn. My name's Stuart Lee. My name's Jason Mumford. My name is Jamie Heathcliff. My name is Damien Dempsey. My name is Robert Sheehan. My name is Keith Gillespie. It's Mr. Hector O'Hockagon. My name's Mark Lawrenson. My name is Shane Horgan. My name is Louise O'Neill. My name is Hosier and you are listening to An Irish Man Abroad. So one of the things that I'm really into in terms of my own writing and just life in general is uh, understanding the Irish male gobshite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, whether there is a gobshite recessive gene in all me- Irish men that rears its head at different moments and that no one is, in fact, a complete gobshite. There's yeah. just a gobshite within us and... Irish lads really struggle with kind of tamping it down <laughs> at different times yeah. or or just re-educating themselves as to what thoughtless behaviour is. I think that, you know, you, Lenny, everyone in this does an amazing job of kind of drawing out, well, why are Irish lads acting like this? Like, where is this coming from? What is the reluctance to speak or make the effort? Were you conscious of that at the time? Were you looking at men in general and trying to to reach that in in some way? Because I really felt like it was speaking to me directly. Yeah, I I think I probably have maybe a slightly different relationship to it because I think something at home that was always kind of cultivated in me was a degree of sensitivity and or or not even sensitivity that's that's giving myself way too much credit it was a it was a thing of um I was always able to talk about things that were maybe bothering me or questions that I had at home with my Mm. with my mum and dad and I think that is amazing the key and that's not something that everybody has so I think that that did kind of that then allowed me to feel like I could do things in my life that didn't necessarily follow the script like I was a, like t- not to keep going back to it, but I I felt like I was in a position where I could go off and do acting even though that was never on the cards for me and that I didn't feel like I had to stick to my prescribed social identity that my friends said that I was or that Maynooth said that I was if that makes any sort of sense well, of think, course it makes sense yeah. absolutely the, the pigeonhole that they had for you or that the tradition of a, a lad like you. It's something that I absolutely rail against and I, I absolutely despise is when somebody prescribes something to you and then suddenly when you are when you decide that that's not you anymore, that suddenly they comment on it. Like the only example I have, or there, there's loads, but I think we're like humans aren't, they, they don't have a fixed identity. Yes, they have, I, I, I believe they have fixed um core values and I think that's different from person to person but I think I remember when I got my first job in I I did Great Gatsby in the Gate and I was working with like the most phenomenal actors like Marty Ray, Owen Rowe, people Mm. like that who and I remember I like like if that if something like that isn't going to change you I don't know like at that point I was 21 years of age and I remember I was obsessed with the way Marty Ray dressed. I think he just dressed like like really chic, really cool. Mm. 
Mm. And I went off and I bought <laughs> a pair of trousers that like it looked like he would have worn. And I remember meeting my friends from town after, and they were like, "Oh, look at you in your uh, in your Marty oh. Ray pants." And I remember at the time being so embarrassed, and I was like, "Oh, that is shit." But I was walking home then, and and to be fair, these weren't people from a minute. These were people that uh, would have been in my same more uh, m- like my actory friends. Mm, mm. I was like, "Oh, like it's not even this has nothing to do with kind of with kind of small town politics or anything like that." In fact, I think it would have been more accepted at home because. But but anyway, it was it it was that kind of bitterness and kind of <sighs> oh. I remember being deeply embarrassed. I went really red at the time, but I was walking, walking home, and I was like, "I made a kind." Of, I, that was there was a switch in my head that I was like, "I fucking despise that. I despise that kind of behavior because it's just like, if I wasn't in a position to recognize that that person was maybe jealous or bitter or had had a bad day or something was going on, that could really alter alter my capacity to change and to kind of like." allow forces of change to come into my life and change me for the better like ultimately all those trousers were doing were making me feel better it wasn't <laughs> like i wasn't making a drastic comment but um i think that kind of pigeonholing i just think it's such a boring concept because i don't want to be the person that i was at 16 like in five years time i don't want to be the person that i am now i want to hold on to the core values and things that my parents have taught me and that, that i've taught myself but I can almost guarantee you that I probably won't dress the same. I, I, I might not live in the same place or like all of those things. I just think um, I just think it's a very boring response. I completely hear you. And that's why I was like, just let you finish this thought, because that f- feeling, that grotesqueness of, no, you may not do this thing that I've decided is not who yeah. I see you as, is a kind of pervasive feeling that we get through a number of channels and outlets and media, even the idea that your tweets from years ago can be brought up. But didn't you say back in 2016, as if we have kind of a written manifesto (laughs) of your thoughts and beliefs and you may not change them because they're now written in stone on social media. It it gives me the willies. It fully makes my skin crawl. And I feel like there's so much of this series that really nails what it feels like to be in that transition, to be in that time. And so much of that is down to you guys and the performance that you gave. Can you talk to me about something that I'm sure, again, you've been asked about, but this chemistry, like this is the linchpin. If this is miscast, This just doesn't work. It's always something that uh, fascinates me when I see two actors on screen where it's like, you can't fake that. (laughs) You know, you can't you can't act chemistry. (laughs) 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 Um, Yeah, I I think um, like first and foremost, like I think Louise Kiley and and her team and, and Lenny were relentless in terms of first and foremost, seeking seeking good actors but also like they left no stone unturned in terms of like seeing a vast amount of people for these two parts and I think I think it's 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 not about faking chemistry it's about harnessing chemistry in the right way so I think first and foremost it comes down to I, I remember when I met Daisy in the chemistry reads we both we both just had a very similar and clear understanding of who Connell and Marianne are and I think and I think that like I I completely agree I don't think there's like a pill you can take and suddenly like chemistry exists but I like we just get on very very well and we were I think this job in particular is a very big moment for both of us and we were very keen to get it right and we worked very hard on the job and ultimately when you have a director like Lenny and 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 Hattie at the center of it kind of nursing that and kind of bringing out or focusing in on the chemistry that that is at the center point of the show it's like it's it's just an embarrassment of riches in terms of the talent that was working around both myself and Daisy how do you then when you feel like oh we've got something here uh, this is we've settled on the two of you 
do you then go and try and cultivate it? Like, do you go, let's go for dinner uh, or let's go and do something that will maybe build some trust? We actually didn't because like, I I think it's, I don't, I, I don't know. I think it was just something that, see, I've never been in a position where uh, these are things like that. I think the fact that the casting process was so un- uh, we're left in no doubt in terms of they felt like we were the best people for the job and that ultimately gives you a confidence and I think it gives both me and Daisy a confidence that there's there's something innate about mm. the two of us together that translates well on screen but ultimately I think we were both incredibly relieved that we like were def- we were kind of guaranteed that we were going to have crack with each other because our, our, our sense of humour are the same she's an incredibly generous human being but also she and also she's like an astonishingly talented actress but like there was no kind of like let's go for dinner and and follow these 10 steps in terms of a protocol mm. to develop chemistry because that 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 just doesn't happen like um or, or that's i i'm not of the opinion that that, that you can do that and you ultimately she was it, yeah. she was in yeah she was in london at the time and i was in dublin before before filming started and then we had two weeks rehearsal you know, uh, I've heard this name come up and I've heard this title mentioned, but maybe you can explain it to me. Who is Eta O'Brien and what is an intimacy coordinator? Uh, Eta O'Brien is an intimacy coordinator. She, she, I think she was. She, I could be, I could be right in saying that she is the pioneer of that that um, role being a kind of um, role on set. So basically, what she does is that her role is and this isn't the actual terminology of it, but she's the person who supervises the sexual content in the show. So obviously when I signed on to do the part, I signed a nudity clause, which requires full nudity, uh, full frontal nudity and all of those things. But that doesn't, in, in the past, that would have been it. The show has total, total, excuse me, total rights over your body and all of those things. Whereas an intimacy coordinator is a new phenomenon, essentially, where any days that there is intimate content or, or sex scenes, she comes discuss the scene emotionally and physically in the morning. We, the key to it is that we block the scene in incredible detail so that, that me and Daisy are left in no kind of doubt about what on any given day. And, the, and we're within our rights to change that. If, like, say one day I feel like absolute shit and I have a cold and I don't really want anybody to be kissing mm. my nose it can be as like ridiculous as that that those thoughts are listened to and, 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 and acted upon by the production and I think the role that I felt was so important that that, that Eta fulfilled is that she made me and I can feel like I can speak on Dave's behalf, we felt incredibly empowered, we felt like our bodies were our own and that we were able to really step into those sex scenes and, and deliver what what I believe in the show are, are incredibly intimate and actually re- really beautiful scenes, totally safe within it. And then it felt like Connell and Marianne and not Daisy and Paul. And that, yeah, it just, it just fills you with confidence. And, and Lenny and everyone at Element and, and, and Hetty were totally, totally behind. Like, I don't think they would have done the show if they didn't have an intimacy coordinator because ultimately it's an incredibly I couldn't imagine doing it without an intimacy coordinator I think it would have just been absolutely petrifying yeah and I think the evidence is there for all to see and when people watch this they'll know people listening back to this they'll know exactly what I'm talking about that these scenes are so important to the plot they all have a function they are real in a way that is kind of stunning Mm -hmm. in in some ways. And there's an aspect to it. And I talk about this on our other podcast, Men Behaving Better, in a coming episode. I talk about modeling tenderness uh, and modeling sensitive masculinity or tender masculinity with uh, an educator and how there isn't many examples of it. And here we are and here I am watching this and watching consent being sought Mm -hmm. an active version of consent that isn't 
unromantic, oh, that isn't totally. robotic, it's that so is refreshing. absolutely yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me about the decision to arrive at that moment of Connell saying, "Look, if you want to stop at any point, it won't be weird." I, I find it really difficult to discuss that because it never felt like it was a moment we were trying to extrapolate from the story. It just felt. What I think is so nice about that scene is that it feels natural. It's not like us in terms of the production going like. Look at us being mm, great mm. talking about consent. I think if there's education to be found in it, it's not something that we're consciously doing or not something that we consciously like try to highlight in terms of how we shot the scene. Because what I love about uh, the sex scenes in the show is that normally they start with a scene of dialogue and they finish with the act itself. And that is incredibly refreshing. It's not like couples stare at each other across a bar cut to them having sex in the bedroom it starts with a very intimate portrayal of two people talking to each other and and meeting each other on a kind of intellectual plane that they find so intoxicating that then becomes the physical and i think that you don't see a huge amount of that on screen and in terms of the discussion around consent in, in in that kind of first sex scene in particular i'd be lying if i if i said that it was a big talk talking point in terms of how we rehearsed the scene or anything like that. It just felt like that was the natural way that Connell mm. and Marianne would do it, would have sex. And that's the natural way that Connell would feel a degree of not responsibility because he's not, or it's just Connell being Connell at that point. You know, I think you've, uh, I think it's so, uh, hits the nail on the head that it doesn't, it doesn't feel messagey and it doesn't feel like pay attention kids. It really, if anything, it just feels sexy. It, it makes consent. Yeah. Or it, it makes him more attractive. Consent isn't it? This kind of like, yeah, it's not like sign this NDA <laughs> and you are agreeing consent. All that like nonsense that like you hear the people who are always giving out about political correctness. Of, oh, like, so do you have to sign this contract before we have sex? Like all of that is bullshit. And I think this show, that scene in particular highlights that. You can, you can discuss consent and still... Be yeah, and stay in the moment. <laughs> stay in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, stay in the moment. In the moment, stay in connection with your partner. How much? Uh, like you're straight after this, you went up with Lisa McGee of Derry Girls, a friend of the show, and started shooting the Deceived, the thriller that she's made, uh, and that again is another flip of the switch, another change of gear, and another mm-hmm. thing that's going to bring, you know, your life and your existence into the public eye, to use that term. What's going on in your head in terms of that? Because so many things that I read, everybody's saying, oh, well, get ready for this. I mean, that must play havoc a little bit with your mind that, you know, things are going to, everything's going to change. Being told that all the time, whether uh, you're expecting a kid or about to get married, I found it absolutely melts your brain a little bit because you don't know, well, what if it doesn't? What What does it look like? And what if it doesn't? And there's no guarantees and we're in lockdown. I mean, there's an awful lot for your brain to take in. What's happening in there (laughs) at the moment? Yeah, I, I found this week in particular quite like at the moment we're in like I'm about what well, it's, it's Thursday today and the show's coming out on Sunday and I'm it, 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 it's it's a mentally quite difficult because I always talk to my a Lara my agent about it's quite a noisy industry and and there is there is a lot of people who are really really excited about the show and and me in it and and I, it's totally intoxicating and it's totally exciting to hear people like the, like the show and like you in it. But as you said, nothing is concrete and that actually doesn't serve you. But I'm not, I struggle with kind of, not, I, I find the whole, the whole gratification of being told you're good in something really, really difficult to negate. And I know that's probably not the like, coolest thing to say but you kind of do have to wrestle with that I, and, I, I, and I find it really difficult because like I, the thing that's in my head is like oh yeah but what happens if 
what happens if people think I'm I'm good but I just I, I fall through the cracks? What happens if I don't meet the standards that I want to meet after doing this amazing show? And uh, if I, if I've learned anything in the kind of three or four years of being an actor, it's that you're never fully content. You're never at a point where you where you can rest your heart, like you can you can rest and go ah oh, like. I'm going to take two years off now because I've I've completed it, mate. It's all good. <laughs> that doesn't exist mm. for me or I don't think any other actor. And I think when you're part of something which which I'm incredibly proud to be a part of and I think is, is, is a really, really good piece of work, as you said, nothing is guaranteed. And when something is successful, there's a pressure on you to match that success in the next thing you do and the next thing you do. And... Um, yeah, I I found this week um my brain is a little tired. Mm. But yeah, I think. Well, man, I don't I don't think you've anything to fear. I know that that's probably no uh, reassurance. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like uh, th- this is uh, this is something special. End of story. And right. uh, yeah. you know, I think that this whole period is is very very centering in so many ways because. We don't know if uh, like the BBC are talking about this being the last drama or the only drama they have. And there's a much greater sense of we need to appreciate what we have here and now. And if nothing else does happen, uh, Connell, if, uh, like yeah. you have a huge amount to be proud of. I'm really glad you took the time to do this. Thank you so much for taking the time out to do Thank it. Thank you so much for having me on. I had such a great time with that. And I think I just really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Cheers, man. What can you say about Paul Meskel? A hell of a fella. And uh, there's more, as I said, over on Patreon.com if you want to hear the rest of the conversation unabridged and ad-free. Join us on Patreon.com forward slash Irishman Abroad and become a premium member. Hundreds of you are doing that as we become independent, crowdfunded and member-led. And I'm massively appreciative of those people. If you're extra sound, you have an extra fiver in your pocket each month or you just feel that now's the time to support the podcast when we need you most, head over there and do it. You'll have my undying gratitude and you'll have unlimited access to absolutely everything we do. And boy, oh boy, have we got more podcasts for you. This week, we're going to be putting out the Peter Stringer episode of Men Behaving Better, where he talks about getting yourself in order during a lockdown, using the opportunity to get fit, stay well. And that is like, he's an unbelievable motivator. It got me to straighten my stuff out. Barry Kogan last week got me to look into the intermittent fasting. And honestly, my head has been so clear ever since I took Barry's advice. Uh, We also have another Corona pod coming out during the week, focusing specifically on uh, New York's reaction to the virus and a little bit more that's going to be a surprise guest there and then next weekend as I said Ed Guiney the producer of uh, such great Irish films as what Richard did uh, Room uh, The Favourite uh, The Element Pictures uh, a genius behind the scenes there Ed Guiney is going to be on the show next weekend I can't wait to release that one but this week I've been knocking about myself doing a couple of podcasts I did one for Off the Ball called Off the Bull uh, where I talk about The Last Dance the incredible Chicago Bulls documentary on Netflix right now episodes 1 and 2 went out last weekend 3 and 4 will be out by the time you hear this and basically I go on there and with Kieran Donaghy and a couple of the lads Owen and Ronan I talk about what's happened in the series and we pull it apart a little bit and it's a nice neat little segue into our new series Irishman Inside Basketball which is coming very soon this week I sat down with Roland Lazenby for that series he is the author of course of the definitive Michael Jordan biography a man who's worked in the NBA for years and years and years and boy does he have some stories to tell that's one of my favourite interviews I think I've ever done and that will be a big part of that series. I think it's going to be episode two. But that's on the way. The only way, of course, as I said, to get access to everything when it comes out before anyone else gets it and in its full glory is to join us on patreon.com forward slash Irishman abroad for the premium content and access to our archive. I don't have much else for you. I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit whacked and wrecked by this whole experience. I'm just so happy that uh, so many of you are downloading the show and getting in touch with your uh, feedback and support. 
I am sending my best wishes to all of you. Stay safe. Look after each other. I wish you health, happiness and a full fridge. My thanks to Brian Connolly for his production, to Tina and Mikey for making it all possible, to Ellie Norton for setting this up. And of course, to Paul Meskell for his unbelievable generosity in this chat. And I will see you next week for another episode of An Irishman.